dimensions and operation of the larger area. Okay. And therefore, W star independent if any two normal operations have an extension to the normal operation of the larger And they're called C star independent in the product sense if the extension can be taken as a product. And they are called W star independent operationally in the product sense if the extension, the normal extension, can be taken to be normal. Okay. Can be taken to be a product. So four definitions of operational independence, operational C star, operational W star, operational C star in the product sense, and operational W star in the product sense. <coughs> Comments on this definition. First of all, I hope you find this definition very natural, because again, it is designed on the same pattern. The, general, the same pattern as the other ones, namely the general core idea. What was the core idea, you remember? The core idea was that two subsystems of a larger system are independent if anything which is possible for one in its own right and anything which is possible for the other in its own right are jointly possible. Here is the idea. An operation for this, an operation for that, for that are co-possible as an operation on the large system. That's what operational independence expresses and expresses in the, in the natural sense that any two operations here and there have a joint extension to an operation on the large system. Okay. Now, yes? Uh, in the previous slide about uh, uh, injectivity. Injectivity. Uh, you, okay, well, this is a good property for quantum algebra theory can be extended. Yes. Uh, however, if you consider the uh, some uh, on MR algebra and uh, some algebra, and you have the normal operation to this uh, type of time in the uh, can you extend it for a normal operation? I don't know. Uh, you 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 and uh, you actually anticipated an issue which I was to raise. I don't know what the situation is. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe that's just the, the limitation of my knowledge. I would very much like to know what the situation is. Um, I don't know. Okay. I suspect that the, that the answer is no, mm -hmm. but I don't know for sure. So any of, if any of you operator whatever specialist would know, mm -hmm. that would be very helpful. Uh, Thank you. Because, Thank you. because you, you told us that uh, this is very nice property for... Uh, yes. Um, extension property operation, however, this is a problem. Yeah, this okay. is a problem. Okay. Uh, it's a very good, very important remark. You anticipated something crucial here. It comes up, I hope I can get to that. Uh, it's a crucial issue. Uh, not knowing the answer to that question of yours prohibits claiming certain operational independence to hold uh -huh. in a certain form mm -hmm. in algebraic quantum theory. Uh -huh. Thank you, this is very good. Thank you. Very good, very perceptive. Okay, so I, but I hope that you find this definition very natural. Okay, it's the most natural thing you can think of. Uh, it's, it's really annoyingly natural. Okay, good. Anyway, comments. States, I, I claim that states are special cases of operations, yet I claim that operational C star and W star independence are not special cases of C star and W star independence. This is a trivial remark, but it's good to keep in mind. Why? Well, because operational independence requires extensibility of a larger class of CP maps, not just states, but a larger class. But the extension is allowed to be in a larger class of CP maps, too. So if there is no a priori prima facie relation between the two. As we saw, the C star and W star independence expresses that, no, that any two partial states are co-possible. The operational independence can be thought of as expressing that any two state transitions are co-possible. Because remember, the dual of an operation acts in the state space. And so if operational independence holds, that means that any two state transitions defined by these uh, duals are co-possible. This is how you should uh, conceive of them. Okay. Now here are some 
elementary results on operational sea strike, drop strike dependence, uh, which relate these two concepts to the uh, independence hierarchy I flashed here. Namely, that operational um, independence of operational C star independence of two C star algebras, E1 and E2, intergenerated uh, algebra, and tail that the two are C star independent. So operational C star independence is stronger than C star independence. I didn't say it's strictly stronger, but I said it's stronger. Okay, uh, and this is in the case uh, uh, also for W star independence and W star operational independence. Namely, if you have two mutually commuting von Neumann algebras on a separate Weber space, then operational W star independence of the two entails that the two are W star independent. So up the operational independence in C star and W star sense entails C star and W star the next observation or proposition is that this pair of C star algebras are C star independent in the product sense if and only if they are operationally C star independent in the product sense. And the same holds for the W star version of this. And knowing that C star independence, uh, C star independence and W star independence relate to each other, we know that operational W star independence in the product sense entails operation with C star independence in the product sense, but the converse is not true. So this is uh, what is known about uh, the issue. There is a little paper in the International Journal of Theoretical Physics where this is this can be read. About. Here is a problem to which uh, I don't know the answer. Is it the case that operational C star and W star independence without the product assumption and pair W star and C star independence in the product sense? And I conjecture that the answer is no, but I don't have any counter example at this point. Okay. So if you want to think about it, that would be important. Uh, I really think that it's not the case. Uh, the product assumption is very much needed to entail the W star independence and the C star independence in the product sense. Because but you know why this, you know the significance. The significance of that would be that we you have an operational condition for the tensor product uh, structure to be present if it turned out to be the case that operational C star and W star independence without the product assumption entail the uh, C star and W star independence in the product sense because we know that W star independence in the product sense and pairs uh, the tensor <coughs> product structure is equivalent to it in the case of commuting algebras. So, no counter example is known, but I think the conjecture is true. More generally, what is the relation of the operation of C star and W star independence to the other notions of, in of in the independence hierarchy? Uh, nothing has been done in that connection. You might ask all sorts of questions about the uh, relationship, and this has not been done. So here is the hierarchy again, with the insertion of operational W star independence and operational C star independence here. And uh, you might want to ask about the arrows, uh, the other arrows, which are missing uh, here. Good. A remark about the ejectivity issue. Um, you recall that the uh, von Neumann algebras were defined operational independent in a given algebra. Uh, and this is very important because of, of the fact which I pointed out that operations on subalgebras are not necessarily extendable. Excuse me. Yes. About the injectivity, uh, there is a counterexample that normally used in EMAP cannot be extended to as a normal use of EMAP. Wonderful. Really? Uh, so there is an answer to your question then. Yeah. I, I would very much like to know the reference. Uh, yeah, I think it's very famous. 
if you take a hyperbinary to a factor to one. consider identity map to itself and consider this hyperbinary to one factor as a subalgebra of B of H. This is a counterexample. I see. Okay. Please, reference. Thank you for all the references. We have been corresponding, uh, well, it is a one-sided correspondence to some extent. I hope you don't mind if I disclose this here. We had some little discussions after the lectures. And uh, I asked, uh, what's your name, sorry? Uh, Hidoshi Ando. You go? Oh, that's the Ando. Ando? Yeah. I asked Ando to send me some references, which he, he did. Uh, it's there in my inbox. It's very useful. Thank you very much. I do appreciate uh, very much that. Uh, reference as well. And this answers your question. The, the answer is no, which means that uh, indeed, in that particular situation which I'm going to present you, it's not trivial what the status of a certain independence condition is in, in quantum field here, namely the W star independence. It's not trivial. Good, wonderful, thank you. So, uh, this is the comment, this is what we have just talked about. Uh, injectivity, so, is sufficient but not necessary in general to ensure a necessary but not sufficient condition for operational independence uh, for the two sub algebras in the large algebra we hold. So, the hyperfiniteness, uh, which is injectivity of all two algebras in field theory, can be interpreted as a sufficient condition that ensures a necessary condition for operational consistent independence to hold for local algebras in quantum field theory. And this gives us some hope that C star and W star independence holds in quantum field theory indeed. And uh, this is what I claim here not in this case. So I present you a, a couple of propositions. So for that purpose, let's just assume that we have a net of local for Neumann algebras in a Hilbert space which satisfy the standard axioms of quantum field theory and consider two double cones, D1, D2, and the double cone D, which contains both double cones. And then the following calls, this pair of von Neumann algebras, which again are associated with space-like separated double cones, are operationally C star independent, even in the product sense, in the algebra which is associated with the double cone that contains the two double cones. And injectivity is crucial in this, because, because what you no, is that these two algebras generate the tensor product if they are space-like separated then uh, then that's the case and then C star independence holds for that and then in, from the generated uh, tensor product you can extend the operation to the double cone because the double cone uh, is injected, the double cone algebra is injected. So again, you consider two strictly space-like separated space-time regions, double cones, and the large double cone which contains both. Then operational independence in the C star sense holds for this pair in the Neumann algebra which is associated with that double cone. And this is because, and I've also given my unit proof, because these two are, because they are strictly space-like separated, they have the speed property, they actually have uh, the generated for Neumann, the generated for Neumann algebra is isomorphic to the tensor product, and then uh, operational independence falls in the tensor product, and from the tensor product you can extend the operation to the cone, uh, to the double cone algebra, because the double cone algebra is so this is good. I hope you are you're satisfied. You, at this point, you should be relieved. OK, here's a very natural independence condition. And it holds 
where it is supposed to hold, namely for the case of strictly space like separated from the process. Okay. Another proposition that these two are operationally doubly independent in the product sense in the generated von Neumann algebra, which is isomorphic to the tensor product because they are doubly independent in the product sense as well, because the split property holds. And then here's the question are they also doubly independent in the product sense in the large cone? And to this, I don't know the answer, because in, I was asking, is injectivity of MD enough? And clearly, it's not enough. And right, right, it's not enough, right? Um, and here, here, was, here was my question out of ignorance. Is injectivity of C sufficient to entail that, that normal CP from a subalgebra are extendable to a normal CP? And the answer to the question is no. And therefore, it's not trivial whether the doubly star independence holds in the product sense in the way it, it holds for a w for C star independence for the codes. I, 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 I knew the negative uh, answer for the more general case. I very famous for this one. Yeah, because for example, the uh, maximal variant uh, um, <coughs> subalgebra for L2. L to think about space, you consider the yoga. And yes. then uh sister algebra generated by essentially bounded measurable function uh, is L infinity space. Uh, the L infinity algebra is a maximal variant for minimum subalgebra of B of A in this case. Yes. And it is very well known that there is no uh, normal condition expectation from B of A on to uh, L infinity. I see. And then this is normal function expectation is naturally the, just the extension of the identity muscle from the L infinity to uh, L infinity inside the field. And so that this is to say that the identity map on the L infinity uh, cannot be extended normal. Uh, I see. But it's, it's very similar to the five to one case. It's almost the same. It's almost uh, the same. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Can, can I? This is very classical, uh, maybe 1960. I see. Uh -huh. I would very much like to have the reference for it because I, you see that I was just ignorant here, um, and it's it's a very very important. I learned now an awful lot. Actually, I've learned an awful lot. Uh, really. um, so thank. I, I would very much have like to have this in some standard reference. Even uh, Alison's paper. Uh, I see. In 1960. Thank you, thank you. Good. Uh, so now you see, uh, right, you see, you see what you see. <laughs> that is to say, uh, here's a problem uh, to which I don't know the answer. And, and what you have just told me, what you have just clarified, makes the, uh, the problem really a problem. Good. So this is just a picture of the situation. Here are the two space-like separated double cones, strictly space-like separated regions. And these, for these, operation of C star independence holds beautifully. Operational W star independence does not hold in the sense that, that these two are not independent W star sense in the large cone, which they, which contains them. Okay. Next, I'd like to turn to a related independence notion, which is called operational separability. For this, is some preparation, some terminology. If you have a local system, if you have a local net in the sense of field theory, uh, and you have two regions, V1 and V2, and a large one which contains them, then this thing here I call a local system namely the algebras associated with these regions, a state on the large algebra, and an operation on the large system as well. Okay. I just call this a local <coughs> system. And I will say that this T on the large, this operation on the large system 
represents an operation on the source small system if that T is an extension of an operation on, say, one of the systems. Okay? Because of the non-extendability of operations we have discussed, it is, this, it is not trivial that an operation on the large system represents an operation which is carried out on the small system. If it is the case, if this large T is an extension of an operation on the small system, then I say that that operation represents an operation carried out on the small system. Okay. Now, if you have a situation, uh, a local system, in which uh, the operation T on the large system represents an operation on the small system, then, of course, you can consider the state change in the large system, which is caused by performing this operation T. Okay. Now, even if this represents an operation on the small system, then this, of course, entails that if you perform that operation on the large system, that will change any given state by one of the small system into a definite other state, V star phi 1. But this doesn't entail that the change caused by that T on the large system is such that if you restrict the large system state to the other system, then that restriction coincides with that system state before the operation has been carried out. You see that? So again, you have a large system, and you have an operation on the large system, which represents an operation which was carried out here. Now, the operation on the large system changes the large system state, it changes the small system states all right, but it changes the large system state as well. And you can ask the question whether the large system state restricted to that system has changed from what it was before the operation was carried out. And you cannot expect necessarily that that is uh, not a change. That is to say that that operation did not change the state of that system. Okay, but if it is the case, then you say that that system, that local system, was operationally separated. So precisely, this system is called operationally separated in the following forms. The operation condition state, this state of the large system, coincides with the original system on AB2 if T is an extension of an operation on AB1. And it coincides with AB1 if T is an extension of an operation on AB2. In other words, I call the system operationally separated if that operation, if it represents an operation that was carried out here, leaves that system in that way. And if it represents an operation which was uh, carried out here, leaves that system state in that way. Okay? This is the case, then I call the system operationally separated. Uh, this operational separateness is a kind of no signal requirement via the operation T. It means that an interaction measurement operation with system AB1 or with AB2 does not change the state of the remote system AB2 or the remote system AB1. So this is the uh, abstract formulation of a uh, no signaling via an operation. The idea goes back to Einstein, just a historical remark here. Einstein, when he criticized classical uh, standard quantum mechanics, he, he pointed out that it violated somehow this operational separated condition. This is what he writes. If one asks what is characteristic of the realm of physical ideas independently of the quantum theory, then above all, the following attracts our attention. The concepts of physics refer to a real external world. That is to say, ideas are posited of things that claim a real existence independent of the perceiving subject, body, spirit, and so on. And these ideas are, on the other hand, brought into as secure a relationship as possible with sense impressions. Moreover, 
it is characteristic of these physical things that they are conceived of as being arranged in a space-time space continuum. Further, it appears to be essential for this arrangement of the things introduced in physics that at a specific time, these things claim an existence independent of one another insofar as these things lie in different parts of space. And let me just shorten this. Field theory has carried out this principle to the extreme in that it localizes within infinitely small four-dimensional space elements the elementary things existing independently of one another. And for the relative independence of spatially distant things, this idea is characteristic. An external influence on A has no immediate effect on B. This is known as the principle of local action, which is applied consistently only in field theory. So what Einstein says it as appears here essentially that in, in the field theoretical paradigm, operational separatedness should be the place. This is what I claim how one should read Einstein's 1930, 48 words. This is from the famous paper, Quantum Mechanics and Reality. It's originally in German. OK. Uh, but that was just a historical remark that the, the idea of operational separateness goes back to Einstein's 1948 criticism of ordinary quantum mechanics. Now, does this operational separateness hold in quantum field theory? We would expect it to be the case. Well, for certain operations, it does hold. You see immediately that if the operation is given by cross operators belonging to either AD1 or AD2, then the local system is operationally separated for every state. Well, why? Well, because, of course, local commutativity holds, and this is a crucial explanation or crucial motivation for local commutativity. And the cross operators sum up to one, and the cross operators dividing one algebra, they commute with the other, so there's no measurement disturbance, there's no signaling. Local commutativity excludes no excludes signaling, and this is uh, the motivation why standard motivation as to why local commutativity is an independence condition. But we have seen that general operations are not given by cross operators. So it's not entirely clear, not immediately clear, whether no signaling theorem is true for general operators, operations. Is a no signaling theorem true for all operations? It's a very natural question. What do you think? <laughs> I, I have some opinion that Okay, I'll I make it before you say something. Okay. I would like to ask the okay. students whether they have any intuition. You do see that this is a problem. This is a very natural question. Okay, cross op oper operations given by local cross operators don't violate the no signaling. How about general operations? It's not easy to guess, right? Anyway, since we are running out of time, let me just give, give you the floor. Do you have any view, view on that? Of course you know, yeah. because we have- My head is that the uh, notion of the general operation should be restricted to uh, mathematically representable by class of representation, or we say that the physical operation should be in a uh, sigma. I see. Okay, well, if you take that position, I'm not sure I, I, I agree with that, but if you take that position, then of course, the question is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I don't think it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, uh, I'm presenting you with some, uh, some proposition. The answer to that question mm -hmm. is no. Uh, there's a no, no signaling proposition for operations. This is in a little paper which he wrote with Giovanni Valente in 2012, for every local system in quantum field theory, where the state is a faithful normal state, there exists an operation such that the local system is not operationally separated. Now, should we, what, what, what should we do then? 
first of all, you realize that the condition that uh, for any global system for which the state is faithful is not really a very strong one. There are lots and lots of faithful states. Local states are typically faithful. So the violation of the no signaling is not atypical. And the other commentary is that, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, the local commutativity requirement is not strong enough to exclude signaling for general operators, operations. Um, and I also have here the comment that uh, the operation which violates the you know, signal is the is a particular one which we can find, but there could be other ones. And I think it's a reasonable question to ask, what operations have this property? Can you characterize those operations somehow which have this feature? Can you classify them in any way? Now, of course, if you have the view that only crowds represent two operations are physically meaningful, then this is not really physically relevant. Anyway, what can you do? What are the options in view of this no, no signal situation? But you can conclude that the notion of operation in this generality is incompatible with the locality and causality as it is expressed in quantum field theory. And this, I think, would be a major conceptual philosophical tension in the theory because that theory, as I claimed in the very beginning, if you remember, uh, is viewed by the physicist, and I think for good reason, as the theory which expresses, embodies, is compatible with the causality intuition we have on the basis of the special theory of relativity. So that would be uh, somehow against our intuition. Uh, or you can say that these operations, as this, this is Professor Ozawa's position, these operations are just unphysical. Okay? Because all operations should be in, in, a, in, in, in that sense of, of being representable by crowds operators. A problem, a possible problem with that, uh, with that position is that you would then have to, uh, to defend the position that the uh, physicality, in that sense, is attractive uh, on some other grounds. Can this be done? Maybe it can be done. I don't really know. I have not thought of this. But another position is, which I have thought about, is that you can weaken the notion of operation and separation in such a way that the weakening is conceptually motivated, acceptable, and attractive, intuitively, and that the weakened position can be proved uh, to hold for all operations under reasonable conditions. And I'd like to explain how this can be done in the remaining of this lecture. I call uh, a local system operationally separable, not separated, but separable, if the following is true. If it is operationally separated, there is no problem with that and from, from the perspective of causality, or if it is not operationally separated, then, and T is an extension of an operation on A, B, on C, then there exists an other operation, T prime, which coincides with the original operation T on A, B, 1, and <coughs> for which the system is operationally separated. That is to say, if it is restrict, if the, that the disturbance is restricted to the subsystem on which the operation was performed. Okay. So the idea here is that maybe the, this causally bad behavior, the failure of operational separation of the local system here, is due to the fact that the operation T, which represents a local operation on AV1 or AV2, just happened to be a causally bad representative, and then you can choose another representative which coincides with the original one on very close to form, and which is causally bad behavior. So the causal bad, causal bad behavior is curable somehow. That's the idea. If an operation is causally badly behaved, maybe I can replace it by another one which is causally all right, and which coincides with the original operation on the local system. That's the idea. And I claim that, well, that's reasonable, 
And certainly, quantum field theory should be operationally separable, at least if it is to be accepted as a theory which is compatible with uh, the intuition of causality on the basis of special theory of relativity. Now, a small remark. Of course, one can distinguish operational separability in the C star sense, in the W star sense, depending on whether you require the operations to be normal or not. So you have two sorts of operational separability, the C star and the W star. And the question is, what is the relation of them? And I don't really know what the answer to that is. I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is. So there are two notions of operational separability. Are they equivalent? Are they not equivalent? I don't know. This is relatively new, so I have not been able to say anything about it. <clears throat> and, OK, the next, before we go on, uh, you, you now ask the question whether quantum field theory local systems are such that they are operationally separable. You would want this to be the case. I claim that this is the case. Operational separability actually holds typically for local systems. And the way to show that is to relate this operational separability to operational independence. That's what I'm going to do. Here's a little proposition. It's trivial, really. If the pair is operational C star independent in that algebra, then for every phi and every operation, this local system is operationally separable. And the same holds for the W's version of this claims. Um, so local systems in algebraic quantum field theory are operationally separable if operational independence holds in algebraic quantum field theory. And we have seen that it does, at least in the C star sense, typically. In the W star sense, it's not entirely clear. So the, the state of the matters is uh, the following proposition, which is the corollary of what I already presented here. If you have local von Neumann algebras associated with strictly space-like separated double cone regions in a local net satisfying the axioms, and D is a double cone containing T1 and T2, then this local system is operationally C star separable for every phi and T. Is the W star version of the above also true? Uh, we don't know because we don't know what the status of the W star operational independence is in quantum theory for the reasons we discussed. <coughs> it's unclear whether the uh, operations which are normal are extendable to the double cone, to the large double cone. That we don't know. It poss poss probably it is not the case. Okay. So, uh, I could actually finish here, but uh, there is a little twist on these notions. And I think I should, I should finish here, going jumping to the summary. There's an extra twist on the notions of operational separability and operational independence, which I don't have time to detail. I think it's quite understandable if you read the slides if you're interested in that. So I suggest, because we are running out of time, that I jump to the conclusion uh, and uh, just summarize what the situation is now. And again, I make the slides available, and you will see in what way one can even specify the operational independence and operational separability notions into some subclasses. And there are open problems about them, but I don't have time to detail them. So let me just jump to the conclusion then, or the summary. I think I have convinced you that there is indeed a rich hierarchy of interdependent, non-equivalent independence notions. And they are formulated in algebraic quantum mechanics using the theory of concepts and terminology of operator algebras, uh, C star and W star algebras. And a particular version 
of that independence uh, concept is operational independence. It's a physically very natural independence concept expressing the idea that any two operations which you can perform on two subsystems of a large system are jointly realizable as a single operation on the large system. And this operational independence uh, concept can be given technically different formulations in terms of uh, CP maps. And they fit also very naturally into the hierarchy of other independence notions with open questions about them. And these operational separability and independence conditions uh, express the compatibility of the notion of operation of relativistic causality and locality. So uh, the unit deserving completely positive maps as operations don't pose any particular problem from the perspective of the logical incompatibility of this notion of creative causality as understood and expressed in local quantum physics. And both operational independence and operational separability holds for typical local algebras in quantum field theory. As we have seen, they hold for double covalents which are strictly space like separated. Uh, at least in the C star sense, they hold without any problem. For the W star sense, it's not entirely clear whether they hold or this because of this continuity problem. And then you might want to ask, what's the situation when they are not strictly space-like separated by tangent? Well, then they don't. I, I remain silent about that. The situation is not clear in that case. We have seen that the situation of function of double points is very crazy anyway, because remember how the value and equality behave in that particular situation. So that's a problematic uh, case for which I didn't claim anything about operational independence and operational separability. So there's a lot to be done still, and you are very welcome to discuss any of the issues with me, either the remaining uh, time here in Nagoya or in correspondence or in any other ways. So with this, I would like to thank you for your patience, attention, for your comments. You've been a wonderful audience, and I have had a great time, and I have also learned a lot. And I'd like to thank Professor Ozawa once more for organizing this series of lectures and inviting me here to Nagoya. Thank you very much. Discussion in the afternoon, right? Uh, in, the, in another room, right? Yes, we can do that. Yeah. When, when do we start?